This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. I'm speaking to Dr. Catherine Spence this week about Thomas Robbins, a painter who documented the country estates of the Georgian gentry in all their Rococo splendour. Robbins captured images of this flamboyant age of outdoor design, where gardens were laden with symbolism and crammed full of chinoiserie, follies, ruins and the latest imports of exotic animals and plants. Follow the story of Robbins as he moves from jobbing fan painter to star of his own paintings. The development of the floral borders around his canvases, for which he's famed, and the evolution of the Georgian garden and what remains of this style today. Catherine begins by telling us who Thomas Robbins was and how he began painting. So Thomas Robbins is a a jobbing artist, um, comes from quite a a normal working class family, um, born in Charlton Kings, which is really now a suburb of Cheltenham. And um, I I think it's just absolute good fortune that a a gentleman who was a Huguenot, Jacob Portrait, happened to be renting a house in Charlton Kings. And he was a fan painter. And Thomas Robbins was apprenticed to him. And, I mean, he may well have just been a a house servant or he may have been, you know, an actual artistic apprentice. But he certainly started his career as a fan painter and you can see that in everything that he does the he's so detailed he's so intricate um and chances are if, if jacob had not been in charlton kings you know thomas robbins would have been an accomplished but probably a, a a sign painter um he wouldn't he wouldn't have been a an artist that we're still uh so sort of beguiled by hmm Wow, that's a, that, yeah, that's a thought to contemplate. Um, so did he stick pretty much around where he lived when he did his paintings? He is very much based in um, Gloucestershire, a lot of paintings in Gloucestershire, um, but he came to Bath for the season. So he's, he's around in the 18th century and he is... Um, coming to Bath, he's living, still living in Charlton Kings. We know that he, you know, refers to himself as of Charlton Kings until uh, the 1760s. Um, but he comes to Bath for the fashionable season. He is in a shop just near the the Abbey and the Baths, working with George Barron, who is a, a toy shop owner. And toy shops, they sold everything, you know, trinkets, uh, fans. Um, engravings, you know, little sort of memorabilia that people would buy from their trip to Bath. And he's there, and we we know he's producing engravings of Bath. He must have been producing fans, but also he travelled out out of the season, out of the Bath fashionable season, and we know he went as far up. Um, up he travelled up the Severn, and he's at Davenport, and he records things like um, Wenlock Abbey, the places which the 18th century accomplished, educated people would have been really fascinated by. So, you know, ruins, you know, people were collecting images of ruins, antiquities. It's that kind of time of trying to understand Britishness. And um, I suppose it's the sort of, you know, it is the, the British arrogance and ego really coming to its fore in the 18th century. We're a very, very powerful country. and really celebrating where we've come from and our history, but adopting all sorts of other things and other cultures as well, which is what he shows in his garden paintings. And the garden paintings, they, they're they really sort of, you know, middle-class gentlemen, you know, people who've, who've made good. They're not the very, very wealthy, you know, born and bred, um, but they're adopting quite extraordinary styles, uh, Egyptian, Indian uh, what we now call chamoiserie, and it's all been cloaked in this style, um, which we call Rococo. And Sir Thomas Robbins is very, very associated with this Rococo gardening style in the sort of mid, mid-18th century. So he travels around, but he doesn't cover the whole country. So when you mention the Rococo gardens, they sound very much an eclectic mix, and they were also an expression of I presume individual personality. Were they were they expressing anything else through the gardens at the time? It's it's 
Oh, so it's just a historian's way, isn't it? We, I mean, I, I don't want to, um, you know, project onto these people, but I, I do, I do feel that they were sending messages with their gardens, and, and lots of historians can read the sort of political messages and political allegiances that were going on. Um, and I, I do think that those who adopted the Rococo style were more liberal-minded. They um, tended to be Whigs in terms of politics, not Tories. Um, and they were very much um, lovers of uh, good, good, free, living outside, sort of the cold regime, living off the land. Um, they, they wanted people to enjoy their gardens and, and, and visit them. And they also had plunge pools and they all had... Um, Lots of fruit and vegetables. They, they, you know, they they used their gardens in a very productive way, um, and they spent a lot of time in the gardens, which is also why you have these buildings. Obviously, they could take tea and eat ice cream. Those are very fashionable things, but it meant their gardens were uh, for all all weathers and all climates. And was there a lot of symbolism used or, um, as you say, political allegiances may be expressed through things like statuary? Um, not as much as, and if you look at somewhere like Stowe, I mean, that is just screaming, um, so, so much imagery that people would have read that there are, there are elements, but not, not to quite the same degree. It's more the whole, the whole kind of atmosphere, the whole feeling, um, even adopting a a Rococo style, uh, of, of, of sort of sinuous paths, um, dotted with, with, buildings but they tend to be on a smaller scale um they're not the great um estates of of, of stowe for instance um but they um by by doing that by um growing their own and, and they're, they're also they are plants people they are they're exchanging plants that seems to be a link as well between the people that thomas robbins worked for and he was very much part of the exchange of Exotic specimens, um, insects, as well as plants. So they they they're very they're very passionate about gardens in the way that I think that we are now as well. They they're growing things and they're trying new things. So I think that the 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 type of plants that they are sharing and growing is symbolic that links them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a more cosmopolitan feel, I suppose, in a garden. <laughs> Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, yes, I agree. You said, obviously, if if somebody favoured the Rococo, then you may read that they were more liberal. Um, mm. What was the alternative style or, or was the Rococo style a backlash against another style that, that came before it? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is what we don't know. I mean, and this is something that I argue in the, in the book, really. Um, it's, you, you can probably look at any garden in the 18th century which, um, and you could say it's got various elements, which you could say is the Rococo garden. Um, but e- equally, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't argue that somewhere like Stourhead or again, Stowe, I'm using that a lot, aren't I? Um, were Rococo gardens, but actually I'm, I'm saying why not? Um, they have very similar elements and they have sil- similar sort of impetus behind them. And it is it is the rejection of the very formal um, and the sort of clipped styles of the 17th century. And this really starts with people like um, Burlington and William Kent. And it's a development of that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, that they would have their classical Palladian style, quite, you know, smaller country house. Um and then they would just go wild in the gardens. So it was a place for, for greater expression. And then they would break that um, symmetry in their houses by putting in sort of double height canted bays. Um, so then they could actually admire the gardens. So that the link is, is very strong. And, and that's something that I found in, in all the houses that uh, Thomas Robbins painted. Uh, they all had later additions in sort of, you know, big window spaces so they could enjoy their gardens and look at them. So the, the link is really important for people um, who, who who adopt these, these style of garden. 
Yeah, that's interesting because you actually do reference the Rococo's, I'm quoting here, the Rococo's requirement of asymmetry. And I wondered how did that manifest maybe in Robin's artwork or in gardens themselves? Yes, I mean, what comes first? I mean, so Robin's definitely, you know, we, we think of him uh, as sort of, you know, sinuous tendrils of, of sort of honeysuckle, always um, framing his pictures, be it a fan or one of these prospects of of the garden views, um, and so you know what you know it goes hand in hand. You know, he 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 couldn't have put beautiful sinuous tendrils around a very you know clipped straight uh, gravel path topiary type scene. It just it would clash. Um, so he's part of it, um, and he's obviously in, encouraging it as well. I mean, his his representations. Um, have have become you know that he he has become synonymous with this idea of the rococo, um, and I mean if you look at somewhere like Painswick, which was put back using his painting, actually there's there's only maybe two sort of sinuous paths. There's some really really straight sort of axle uh, grids that run across Painswick, um, but they're they're linking aspects and features in that garden but those features are things like a statue of pan um and pan the position that he he did originally have near the cold bath and the plunge pool um was the only place where you can see the whole of the garden but it's it's there's some really you know straight diamond shapes and real sort of um crossover lines so this idea that it was all sort of sinuous is is a bit of a uh, a misnomer again. It's it's a combination. It's there's no there's no nice simple way to describe a rococo garden. And of course, they wouldn't have called it a rococo garden. That's something that we've put on it later. Um, it's a sort of you know, 20th century Pesner, John Harris, trying to find a way to to understand these gardens. And because of Thomas Robbins, there's that feeling that perhaps they only lasted. From sort of you know or they were only fashionable from sort of 1750s to the 1770s. Well, that's his working life. So there were others, um, but they they tend to be smaller, the gentry rather than the aristocracy. Um, and Robbins seems to be the person who painted them. But there there are other aspects that are painted or captured at that time, not just by Thomas Robbins, but he has a very very distinct style, which really seems to encapsulate that whole feeling of what a Rococo garden was and what it meant to those um, those owners. And I think I think he knew them. I think he was friends with them. I think he he got what they were trying to do, what they were trying to create. It must have been a very good time to be alive and to be painting. Um, it does look like there was there was a lot of fun to be had. Um, it's interesting what you said about him knowing the people who he was working for, because he quite often paints himself into the pictures, and he, it's it's quite um, close to the mark. I think some of his pictures, he's rolling <laughs> around with ladies, you know, more or less. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit. I mean, imagine improper for that kind of time. Um, you know, so so how did that come about? What was he? You know, was he just having fun when he did that? Well, yeah, I, I like to think he was um, tremendous fun. I mean, you look at his earlier paintings, and he's he's quite you know he's quite slim and studious, and and I mean he's a miniature, you know, but you can always spot him. He's there, and he has you know in those early ones, he's still got his his coat and his uh, his hat on, and he's got his um, drawing board, and he's you know on his own or perhaps with a child. And then as the years go by, he's he's always with a woman. Um, and you know the the coat and the hat have been thrown off, and you're lucky if there's a paintbrush anywhere near him. Um, so no, I think he was having a really good time. Um, and I think you know, but it, it, I think I, I think our our problem is that we are very much the the children of the Victorian period, um, and you know the, the Georgians knew how to have a good time. Um, they lived life, and I think you know when when your life expectancy is is actually quite um short uh you know you do you take you know you take more more enjoyment from it um so yes he gets sort of more portly his nose gets bigger and rounder um and he's you know rolling around in the foreground very you know you know very much on show um i i'm i'm part of the fun i'm part of 
I'm I'm part of the scene here. That's what he's saying. Yeah. So you mentioned he draws borders around his paintings, which he does. That that you know the frameworks really of of the main mm. image uh, using botanical examples, I suppose, of lots of varying types, really. Um, so what was the idea behind doing that? Was he one of the first people to do it? And and what did he actually paint into those borders? Yeah, so, I mean, he, he's not the first to do it. Um, there, you know, I mean, you, you can look, you can go back to illuminated manuscripts um, for sort of rather, you know, uh, sinuous um, floral borders to things. So he's not, he's not the first. But he is incredibly accurate. Um, they are all very identifiable as um, specific specimens. But what is fascinating for me about about him as well is that he's he's part of the exchange. So in the 18th century, you know, the sort of plant hunters um, and people are, are buying from across the world and trying to make things grow here. And um, he he's part of that exchange, that sort of interest in science, which is, is growing. Um, and his son, um, one of his sons, is based in Jamaica, and he is commissioned to paint the, the flora and fauna of Jamaica as a record. And those paintings come back, but also specimens come back, um, be them sort of, you know, you know, dead masses of butterflies, but also live plant matter, which then... Uh, Robbins and his contacts are painting um, and, you know, capturing and adding to their, you know, their, their decorative works, but also people are, are cataloguing and and also then trying to, to grow. And people like Duchess of Portland, you know, she's part of this. She knew Robbins. Um, and then there's the Seamers in Dorset who are really very important in this exchange. And you see this sort of link, actually, that, that the people that um, were part of that of that exchange. They, you, you know, I then found that they, you know, had had a link with Robin, be it they owned something by him, or he had painted their house and garden. Um, so I think what's really driving all of this is actually, more importantly, the botanical record and the insect record that's going on, and then perhaps as as a and aside, he's he's painting their houses um, as a record, uh, and, uh, you know, and as, as a as a as a present. I mean, I think you know that there is a there are commissions. There are definitely commissions. He is a prospect painter, but this this exotic um, exchange is is probably of, of greater importance, um, and probably is what how how he really got to know the people and and. Um, his sort of level of importance is based on that, I think. Presumably, then, what he is painting in the borders does usually bear a relevance to what's found in the garden or in the collection of that particular homeowner. Or is it sometimes just that he'll take things, he'll extrapolate from what's on site and kind of incorporate that into the border? Does it get more exotic <laughs> as he goes on, for instance? Yeah, yes, it does, actually. It does get more exotic as, as his career progresses, but that you know that equally could be because you know the, the, his contacts have opened up and they they've got more things but i i do think there is a, a correlation between what's in the borders and what he saw at at the houses um so fr- friends of mine who are much more um expert at botanical um identification have seen let's say so for example the paintings of woodside they have seen plant in the in the borders in the garden borders of the painting which are then also found in the borders of the framework of the painting um so he is making a link and uh and the type of plants there are um are exotics you know they're not things that everyone would have had at that time so he is he is showing that this particular owner has has an important collection whilst also obviously enjoying painting some something beautiful and something new. So he, he also did some botanical studies, I think, didn't he? So was that just an aside to his normal work? So, yes, I mean, this, this is something, um, there are far more botanical studies and even bird studies and butterfly studies by Robin than there are, you know, finished garden pictures. Um, 
And I think there's, there's a mix of things. There are studies which we then can absolutely link with garden pictures. Um, so he's practicing or, you know, he's, he's spending, you know, a specific amount of time really understanding a particular um, uh, plant and then he can transfer that successfully or transpose that successfully into a, a, a border frame for his painting. Um, but also they are, well, he's teaching, he's teaching how to do botanical work um, and paint insects. And that's um, something that he does with the two Seamers. Hen they're both Henry, father and son, Henry Seamer down at Dorset um, in ha at Hanford House. Um, but they would have also exchanged those those paintings. And so you've got one son working in Jamaica. That is his job, is to uh, collect, visually collect a record. And they come back and they're exchanged and people can copy, including Thomas Robbins. But he has another son, um, also Thomas, um, who is more known as strictly a botanical artist. And he... He very pointedly puts it, the, he signs all his paintings painted from nature in Bath. And these are all exotic um, and, and natural, but, you know, but, but tending to be more exotic um, uh, plants. Um, and so what he's, what he's saying is, I, I've actually got this plant in front of me. I'm seeing it. And so these are things which are being sent probably by their, you know, by Luke, the brother. Um, and so they're, but those would be collected, those would be sold um, and be of as as good value um, and as, you know, as profitable for them as artists, as his prospects of gardens. So he's, it, they're all in, interconnected or all interrelated, but they're, they are about making a living um, and recording things and selling things. And people are collecting, um, they're, they're collecting, you know, views of, uh, antiquities, ruins, um, they're collecting scenes of their own garden, they're collecting fans, um, and they're collecting visual representations of plants and butterflies from the new world. Talking about his commissions, um, I think both Robbins and contemporary artists uh, were painting entire estates. And as I was reading through the book, I was looking at the, you point out actually how, you know, look at the, look at the views, look at how they're um, rendering them. It was almost as if they had used a drone mm. or been up in a hot air balloon or something where they were looking down upon the entire estate. And I wondered if you could just, uh, you know, talk about how they might have visualized those views and also how they rendered them on, on canvas, because it was really interesting, the techniques they used to get the entire estate into one picture. Yes, I mean, there, there are um, artists who uh, do these sort of estate paintings now, and through them, we can understand how, how these artists um, did it. And it, it probably Kip is one of the first, um, and those real kind of bird eye, bird's eye views, trying to get the whole estate in. And um, artists working now, they will literally walk the site um, and and sort of measure it out, you know, foot by foot, and take take notes. And then they just have this extraordinary skill of kind of you know you know imagining themselves above and up. Um, and of course, the whole point was to get the entire estate in. And it comes, I think, from a t tradition of map making, uh, and that's you know where where that that sort of visual up in a balloon aspect comes from um but you know the whole point was obviously to show as much as you possibly could and then as, as time goes by and, and i think maybe influenced by burlington and kent who who start especially at chiswick are introducing sort of uh garden rooms you know d very much different spaces which are hidden and that's something very much in the 18th century gardens um, do not reveal themselves all at once. You know, you're, you're supposed to, uh, you know, turn a corner and be completely, you know, awe inspired by the next scene. Um, and so then people started to realize that actually what you need to do is produce a series of paintings, which um, Robin, you see that Robbins does that as his career goes on. He doesn't actually then try and capture the whole 
whole estate like he did at, at Painswick. Um, he does, you know, aspects of the garden, you know, particular feature, and then they they are more sort of straight on as we recognise a, a photograph um, representation of something. So he he picks on a feature and captures as much as he can around that. So then, you know, that's quite good for him because then he's producing maybe two or three paintings of the same site rather than just one. So in terms of, you know, commercial economic uh, success, you know, yeah, uh, paint paint three paintings rather than one. Yeah, yeah, he was very smart. Um, and that just oh, that yeah. technique is, is, for somebody like me, who is utterly useless at visualising that kind of thing, it's it's <laughs> very impressive. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it, yeah. So you mentioned Painswick. Um, my last question is, are there any examples of Rococo gardens left? Yeah, I mean, there, there are more Rococo gardens than we would like to admit. Um, so, you know, yes, okay, so there's Painswick, Painswick Rococo Garden, um, absolutely put back using his painting in the 1980s. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we still strive very, very, very hard to make that garden as accurate as we can to how it was in the 1740s, 1750s. But I would argue that there are gardens like Prior Park in Bath, which was um, as Rococo, um, also drawn by Thomas Robbins. There are loads and loads of drawings that he did of Prior Park Garden. There must have been a finished painting, quite sure there was. Um, and there are definitely sort of elements in those bigger gardens. Um, but people, I don't know, garden historians aren't aren't keen to um, you know, say that they're Rococo. But I mean, I would say there are aspects at Chiswick, um, at Payne's Hill, at Stourhead, which you could say have have a Rococo feel to them. Thank you to Catherine for talking to me about Thomas Robbins. Catherine's book is incredibly thorough and gives such an insight not into just the gardens of the time, but also the historical backdrop against which Robbins was working. So if you love gardens and art history, I recommend it. Thanks to you for listening as well. Now, if you're gardening in the UK and you have a fig tree in your garden, you may be pruning it about now. Have you ever heard the story that there are dead wasps in figs? Of course, there is one person who will have the answer as to whether or not this is true. Dr Ian Bedford. Originating from Asia Minor, figs have been picked, traded and eaten by people across the world for thousands of years. And besides becoming a popular festive treat, they're now recognised as a superfood, high in natural sugars, minerals and soluble fibre. Often referred to as a fruit though, a fig is actually an inflorescence, a cluster of small flowers with seeds that develop within a bulbous swelling at the tip of a stem. Today, commercially grown fig trees are mostly female varieties whose flowers within those bulbous swellings self-pollinate. But they'll have originated from ancient fig trees whose flowers could only be pollinated by a very special insect, a tiny stingless wasp called the fig wasp. Ancient fig trees still grow within the tropical countries today and their unique association with the tiny fig wasp reveals a truly remarkable tale of co-evolution. A biological system that, from fossilised evidence, has been going on for over 30 million years. The process begins when flowers inside the young figs begin producing a powerful fragrance that attracts the female wasps that are hatching out from older, mature figs. However, the only way the wasps can reach the flowers in the young fig is by squeezing through a tiny hole at the end, which rips off their wings. Once inside, though, the wasps are trapped and spend their final days laying eggs and pollinating the fragrant flowers with pollen that they'd collected from the old, mature fig that they'd originated from. The wasps then die inside the young fig, whilst their eggs hatch into little grubs that feed and grow on the developing seeds. After just a few weeks, they pupate before hatching into new adult wasps. The males, which are wingless, appear first and wait amongst the seeds for the females to hatch. 
they are then mate, and whilst the females collect pollen inside the now mature fig, the males perform their final act, chewing holes through the fig wall so the pollen-laden females can escape and follow the floral scent of a new immature fig, just as their mothers had done two months previously. So in answer to the question, are there really dead wasps in a fig? Then it'll be no, not in the commercial self-fertilizing varieties, but absolutely yes, in the ancient varieties that continue to exist in symbiotic harmony with their special little fig wasp pollinators. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.